So hello everyone. Today we are going to discuss two phase passive thermal management technologies and uh, in this lecture we will be essentially talking about introduction to two phase passive thermal management. Uh, we will focus on conventional heat pipes as an example of two phase passive thermal management. Uh, just to remind you that uh, passive thermal management can also be achieved for example by natural convection which we have already studied. Uh, here we are talking about two phase systems and we will be concentrating on conventional heat pipes and in this particular lecture we will see what is a heat pipe and then some industrial applications uh, of uh, these conventional heat pipes. So moving on uh, you know uh, let me start with a general introduction to the system. So in many engineering systems you know as you know we, are, we encounter transport of momentum, transport of energy, transport of mass and uh, the universal uh, you know law which generally you know dictates this transport uh, you know this is what is written here that the net change which we want net change in the tra momentum transfer or net change in energy or net change in mass it depends on the driving potential that means it depends on the potential which is there to change and uh, of course in a natural system there will always be resistance to change for example in this uh, cartoon on the right we want to convert the chemical energy of the fuel to thermal energy and then the thermal energy to the kinetic energy of the steam uh, and then from there we are running a turbine converting into mechanical energy. So what are the potentials which are available in terms of chemical potential in terms of uh, the pressure energy uh, you know that will depend on how much net change of uh, you know energy we are able to do. And then of course in every energy transport uh, in this domain we will have some resistance. Now the issue is the relative magnitude of one potential with respect to some other potential will decide which change will dominate because in a normal system there may be several forces which are acting. Uh, for example gravitational force, pressure energy, kinetic energy, uh, you know magnetic forces, thermal forces. Depending on which uh, potential will be dominant we will usually take that as the dominant factor and then the others are neglected usually in a, uh, in, a in a normal framework when we are formulating the problem. So now if you see uh, let's say take an example of electrical energy in electrical energy you know uh, the, the desired change is the electric uh, electric current we want to move the electrons from location A to location B and there is a potential difference uh, which is available in the form of electromotive force which is the available potential or the voltage. So we write this uh, change that net change is proportional to the potential to change and of course uh, in the denominator will come the resistance and this is what we call as the electrical resistance uh, which we write as the potential to change divided uh, I mean the potential to change divided by the desired change. Uh, so this is R electrical is equal to V upon I. Similarly in thermal systems uh, we have the desired change as the heat transfer and the available potential to change is the temperature difference. So if you see electrical analogy the potential difference EMF uh, is related to the thermal potential difference which is the temperature difference uh, in terms of thermal systems. So Q is proportional to delta T or uh, analogous to the electrical, el electrical resistance uh, we can write a thermal resistance as R thermal as delta T divided by Q. So if you compare this uh, you see the analogy between the two. This is the, the potential to change, this is the resistance to change and this is the desired change which we want uh, from, the, from the system and that is the heat transfer. So uh, we will uh, utilize this concept of thermal resistance uh, frequently in our lecture and therefore you should understand the universal uh, law which is the net change is proportional to uh, the potential to change divided by the resistance. The resistance will always come in the denominator and the potential to change the magnitude of that will come in the numerator. So all our equations of change uh, be it electrical uh, flow or uh, you know thermal energy flow uh, they are uh, you know guided by the same principles. Now the question is why phase change technology, why two phase systems, you have been studying single phase systems so far, why do you go for a two phase system. So let us look at this, 
so if you see you know in a normal convective equation which you have already studied q dot is proposed is equal to h a delta t or you can write r thermal as delta t upon q and then we can write 1 upon h a as the thermal resistance which you have already studied now in any uh, thermal systems uh, you know they are typically guided by the material constraints let the electronic components uh, you need uh, the silicon doesn't operate beyond a certain particular temperature similarly uh, you know uh, ic engines the uh, let's say the material of the piston and the cylinder liner and other things will dominate uh, the highest temperature which you can reach in combustion the ambient temperature is usually fixed so what in reality what happens is that the delta t for the designer is actually fixed by material constraints and the ambient uh, and uh, if the q is increasing let's say the demand of heat dissipation is increasing and if you talk about miniaturization then area is decreasing so essentially delta t is fixed more or less by design constraint and for miniaturized systems the a is decreasing so what the the only way which we can in, enhance the q on the left hand side of this equation is by actually increasing the heat transfer coefficient now uh, how do you do that so if you see this is a very typical diagram which you all should understand and which we should remember also to a certain extent that at least the orders of magnitude so if you see if you take examples of natural convection which you have already studied uh, you saw that uh, with air as the medium the heat transfer coefficient was of the order of 10 to 15 or 20 maximum uh, you know watt per meter square kelvin if you use some oil or some water let us say uh, you know uh, then it can the natural convection can increase but uh, mind you this is a log scale here uh, so it can increase of the order of 500 or so but then that is the limitation after that natural convection that is uh, the uh, you know the flow which is uh, uh, related to the buoyancy or the change in density which happens because of the temperature gradient uh, that's the passive uh, flow of uh, you know fluid uh, which convects in a natural system uh, because of the delta t uh, we are limited uh, to about let us say 500 of that order or 600 watts per meter square kelvin if you change the parental number of the fluid uh, uh, air of course is limited to very low uh, heat transfer coefficients so then what you do is you to increase it to one order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude you go to force convection so that means now you have an active system okay so you start using a pump uh, now if you if you use air again uh, you are limited because uh, air is not a very good uh, convective medium also the parental number is of the order of one uh, and if you then change the fluid uh, then you can go to one or two orders of magnitude you can reach up to 10,000 or uh, of that order 5,000 uh, to 10,000 uh, maximum uh, because after that the Reynolds number becomes very high and your pumping power becomes very large so you really don't uh, you are limited uh, to such uh, values here then what do you do you change the change the physics go from single phase to a two phase system that means now you start uh, making use of the latent heat and as you know latent heat of water for example is very high and whenever phase change enthalpy take i mean is, is transferred it's a large amount of heat and the delta t uh, is very small because uh, you are actually doing the phase change so essentially phase change occurs at as you know as at at a, at a, at a uh, you know isothermal conditions the pressure and temperatures are locked and therefore if you remember your pressure enthalpy diagram uh, you go to vapor from the liquid phase uh, at, a, at 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 the constant temperature line you know this is the constant temperature line so therefore the delta t becomes very small in that case and so delta t is very small and the q dot is large because you are talking about the latent heat here okay so it's a large amount of heat so thermal resistance in a convect in a two phase medium becomes very small or uh, you can say that h is very large uh, you know and you can see here in phase change heat transfer for example boiling etc uh, heat transfer of the order of 10 to the power 5 uh, watts per meter square kelvin is easily possible so therefore uh, uh, you know you can actually uh, you can have active two phase systems like flow boiling or you can have passive two phase system uh, we will of course concentrate in this lecture on uh, passive two phase systems because they are proven to be the best solutions for variety of thermal management issues they are passive uh, they have very large heat transfer co coefficient 
they make use of the latent heat and there is no external pump which is required to uh, to run these systems so let us uh, take an example of the heat pipe which is uh, uh, the most uh, convenient uh, and the most uh, interesting uh, you know uh, true phase passive technology uh, so what is the difference between active and passive active cooling of course requires electrical energy like a pump passive cooling requires no active source of power uh, ref of course please remember that refrigeration requires lowering the temperature below the ambient and require electrical work for achieving low temperature so we are not talking about a refrigeration system here okay <coughs> we are talking about a heat transfer system uh, and if you see active systems then you can have liquid pump looped you know you can have a uh, you can have a liquid uh, which is uh, there is a pump which pumps the liquid to a electric uh, electronic uh, chip and then this liquid comes back here this is all single phase okay and this is like an active system because the pump requires some energy uh, or work done work has to be done on this pump uh, for uh, liquid to circulate in this in this circuit uh, and uh, uh, peltier cooler if you remember is an example of active refrigeration but we are what we are going to do is we are going to use a passive sink like a passive device where uh, there is no electrical work okay uh, so heat will get transferred from one location to the other mind you we are not talking about refrigeration here we are only talking about a passive device by which uh, heat can be transferred from location a to location b without any external power source requirement so now comes the question what is a heat pipe how does it achieve this passive thermal management so if you see uh, the definition of a heat pipe it says that it's a synergistic engineering structure which is equivalent to a material having a thermal conductivity which is greatly exceeding to that of any known material so now it is like a superconductor which means like it's a superconductor okay so how does it work uh, so let us see the the, the the construction of a heat pipe now heat pipe in, a, in the most simplest form will be a tube uh, you know uh, a simple tube uh, like uh, it can be a copper tube or a stainless steel tube or cylinder uh, and uh, it will be uh, let's say evacuated it will also have uh, a, a, a wick which you can see here which you, in the cross section uh, in the cross section we can see the wick uh, here uh, and uh, once you evacuate this system and then uh, you so when you evacuate there is nothing inside it becomes devoid of material uh, and then you put uh, only enough liquid inside it some liquid let us say in, in uh, right now for the sake of discussion we will take copper water heat pipe so it's a copper tube let us say and uh, the uh, the working fluid which we will fill inside is water uh, so as soon as the water goes inside a vacuum medium uh, or a vacuum space uh, naturally it will flash or it will uh, evaporate uh, in a sense that it will uh, like like cavitation uh, thermodynamics uh, will will ensure uh, that equilibrium condition comes very quickly because it's uh, the, the the liquid gets stretched because of the low vacuum inside and then naturally there will be uh, evaporation mechanical boiling like cavitation uh, and uh, some liquid the, uh, the liquid will go and rest in the in the porous media which is the wick structure which is all around so it is wrapped around it so i can make a diagram here you can see that the porous media in the cross section is looking like this uh, so something like that uh, so because of the capillary action the liquid will all go inside and rest and the vapor will come in the vapor space here in in between which is the annular space this is the vapor space okay and uh, if you have a pressure transducer uh, you know if you if you have a pressure transducer which is attached here uh, you know it will start showing the saturation pressure which is corresponding to the temperature at which this pipe is uh, in the room so if it is the room temperature and if it is water it will show the saturation pressure corresponding to the room temperature for water if it is ethanol then it will show the saturation pressure corresponding to ethanol at the room temperature which is let us say 25 degree centigrade uh, so your phase uh, phase tables uh, or uh, thermodynamic property tables will tell you uh, what is the saturation pressure corresponding to the temperature at which the heat pipe is stored so that will be the pressure which will start showing and of course uh, the temperature will be the local temperature of the room where you have done the filling and equilibrium will come 
uh, and the heat pipe all the liquid will be in the in the capillary uh, region uh, it will be here and we will put only enough liquid uh, so that it saturates this wick uh, you know and not more so there is no extra liquid the, all the liquid goes in the porous media which is at the at the periphery in the circumferential periphery of this cylinder and the in between space is filled up with vapor the the this uh, single component two phase mixed uh, 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 working fluid uh, is in equilibrium it comes to equilibrium eventually uh, initially when we were filling it was in non equilibrium because there was vacuum inside uh, but uh, eventually if you give enough time it will come to uh, in a, an equilibrium position now uh, the heat pipe is ready to operate so please remember there is a single component two phase system inside the inside the pipe uh, uh, and now let us see what happens if you heat a particular side so let us say this side is heated up okay so when you heat it is called as the evaporation section naturally there is no pool boiling here it is only evaporation at the interface and you can see because of the porous media the interfaces are formed here and uh, if you will recall the young laplace equation and the clausius clapeyron equation has to work uh, together uh, for this system to start working so uh, of course there will be a young laplace pressure difference because uh, you 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 have a evaporator section here and the pressure is increasing uh, and therefore the local pressure here in this region uh, will increase and this pressure of the vapor is higher than the pressure in the liquid uh, and therefore uh, across uh, the interface there will be a depression uh, of the of the of the of the interface and uh, the curvature will be dominated or will be determined by the young laplace condition uh, and then uh, you can imagine the other side is getting uh, condensed or the other uh, other side is subjected to a cold temperature so you have the heat source on one side the heat sink on the other side so <coughs> the pressure here is is lower of course uh, because of the cold conditions which are here they corresponding to the saturation local saturation pressure which is uh, lower and lo local saturation temperature which is lower than uh, on the evaporator side so what will happen is that the vapor will start flowing in a certain direction uh, from the high pressure area to the low pressure area uh, mind you the pressure difference is not very high because uh, we are essentially it's, uh, we are disturbing the equilibrium and just around the equilibrium uh, depending on the amount of heat which is coming in uh, the latent heat is being used the vapor is being generated uh, and then it is uh, flowing towards the condenser at the condenser side uh, condensation will occur at the interface uh, the the liquid uh, the, the 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 vapor pressure and the liquid pressure will be more or less the same and uh, therefore the meniscus will be flat that means the radius of curvature is nearly infinite it's like a flooding condition there and uh, then since the liquid pressure here is uh, uh, higher than the liquid pressure uh, here uh, the, there is a capillary pressure difference and therefore uh, the liquid will come back passively uh, to the evaporator so you can see here uh, a to b uh, th there is a phase change process then b to c uh, the vapor goes to the condenser then it condenses and then again it comes back so in this way a passive system is generated uh, which the the pumping of this fluid the vapor towards the condenser and the liquid from the condenser to the evaporator this is brought about by uh, the capillary pressure delta p capillary because of the capillary wick which we have introduced uh, on the uh, on the uh, circumference inside this heat pipe so uh, in this way uh, a lot of latent heat is 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 uh, you know transported from location a to location b that is the evaporator to the condenser uh, and uh, since uh, the uh, the delta t is not very high because uh, we we are working close to the equilibrium conditions uh, the delta p between this point and this point is not very high uh, and therefore uh, the delta t is also not very high uh, because the, here is the local saturation pressure corresponding to the evaporator and the local saturation pressure corresponding to the condenser uh, and therefore uh, you see that the thermal resistance is nearly zero uh, uh, and uh, you can see at a very low thermal resistance a large quantity of heat gets transported from the evaporator section to the condenser section and that that is why it is it is defined like a synergistic engineering structure 
uh, which is equivalent to a material having a thermal conductivity greatly exceeding to that of any known material. So uh, this is the way a heat pipe works. I hope you have understood it. Uh, now we will see more and more examples in the coming uh, slides. <coughs> Just to give you a brief background, uh, the historical development of heat pipe uh, before we take up more examples of the modern day industrial usage. Uh, a series of patents were filed by the Perkins family uh, which were like a uh, which were structures which were sim similar to a heat pipe. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a little later. They were called as thermosiphons. They didn't have any weak structure and they were only operated by gravity. So right now uh, I have not introduced them to you but you will see that they are simpler than heat pipes and uh, they were uh, patented long back uh, in, in, in the 19th century. Then the capillary structure the way we have seen just now uh, was introduced by Gaugler in 1944 in General Motors Corporation uh, and then this particular device uh, you know rested in the GM Corporation internal files for many many years and uh, in the Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, you know it was sort of reinvented uh, in 1962 by Grover and then of course later on it was uh, understood that uh, before Grover uh, GM already had this type of a development internally uh, in 1944. Uh, Grover gave the name heat pipes in 1966 patent and uh, then an analysis uh, was later on uh, simultaneously done by uh, the first paper uh, of a proper analysis in 1965 by Cotter. Uh, and then within two years, uh, you know, the heat pipe started, uh, you know, flying into the space. Uh, because they were such a interesting, such a powerful and uh, so, such high efficient systems. They were passive, so the space uh, agency was very happy uh, because they don't require any active power on space to cool their thermal systems, uh, cool their devices, uh, electronic devices. And then the heat could be taken away from the satellite and it could be radiated to outer space by the radiators which were there on these space vehicles. Uh, the, all the initial efforts in the 60s, the late 60s and the 70s were in the space domain. Uh, it was supported by the space industry uh, in uh, US as well as in Russia, uh, for example, and then slowly uh, it percolated into terrestrial applications. Uh, you know, and then now, of course, uh, heat pipes are there in space as well as in terrestrial applications in a big way. Uh, and of course, newer designs of heat pipes have also come in the market, which we will talk about uh, in the later part. So this is a brief summary. Uh, I will not go through each one of them, but you can read it. Uh, how, uh, you know, since 19th century, uh, you know, uh, the uh, and up to the modern day development, uh, you know, uh, these papers are available in the classical literature. Uh, and different designs like cryogenic heat pipes, rotating heat pipes, the heat pipe for temperature control and various other types of variable conductance heat pipe for example were developed. So without going into the details, uh, uh, in, the, in the 70s uh, NASA AMS uh, had the heat pipe space experiments, the heat pipe flew in space. Uh, later on, different different other designs of heat pipes like arterial heat pipes, inverted meniscus heat pipes, etc. were uh, developed. Uh, and then in the recent uh, past or recent history, micro heat pipes came. After that, the loop heat pipes and the pulsating heat pipes or oscillating heat pipes were introduced in the 1990s. Uh, in between, of course, we have development of uh, capillary pumped loops and loop heat pipes, uh, which we will talk about in the, in, in the later lectures. The literature uh, is available throughout uh, uh, the, the, uh, in, in many different forms. Uh, of course, the International Heat Pipe Conference, uh, it started in Stuttgart in 1973 by Professor Manfred Grohl. Uh, and then uh, this uh, conference, uh, this popular conference of the heat pipe community has traveled throughout the world. As you can see, uh, it was also held in 2013 uh, in Kanpur, uh, at IIT Kanpur, in fact, and uh, now uh, 2023 it will go to uh, to, to, to Melbourne uh, in, in, in Australia. <coughs> uh, several books are available uh, on heat pipe technology starting from uh, Dr. Chi's book in 1976, uh, Dunand Ray, Ivanovsky, Peterson and Professor Fagri. Uh, 
uh, Amir Fagri in 1995 and then of course uh, if you see the literature various international journals on heat, trans heat and mass transfer and thermal science uh, are replete with papers on passive two-phase thermal technologies like thermosiphons, gravity thermosiphons, uh, conventional wicked heat pipes, loop heat pipes, capillary pump loops, uh, pulsating heat pipes, micro heat pipes uh, and other types of uh, you know uh, heat pipes. So uh, why are they used? Uh, because you can have a wide temperature range of operations depending on which fluid you take. Uh, it has a high transport capability at low, very low driving temperatures that we, as we have seen. Uh, you, you can have, I mean, we have just seen the example of a simple cylinder, but you can actually have various geometric shapes which have wicks inside uh, and therefore they are very convenient for engineering design applications. Uh, the heat source and the sinks can be isolated with each other uh, and you don't lose any thermal potential. Uh, the temperature at the evaporator is more or less the temperature at the condenser uh, and therefore you can, uh, you have not without any voltage drop, in fact, we are able to uh, you know, uh, transport a lot of uh, current or heat in this case. So it is like a superconductor, electrical superconductor can be made analogous to a thermal superconductor. So heat pipe is like a superconductor. Uh, then it can function as a transformer uh, because you can go from a small area, high flux to large area, low flux uh, at the condenser. And uh, you can also give isothermal conditions because the entire heat pipe is more or less at the same temperature. So wherever you require isothermal sources, like in radiation pyrometers, for example, or in an application of a, a uniformly heated uh, oven, uh, you know, you can use heat pipes. And of course, uh, needless to say, they are highly efficient passive heat transfer uh, elements with no noise. Uh, they are maintenance free. That's why space industry loves them. Uh, and uh, they are simple to design. Uh, there are no moving parts. And uh, these are some of the examples. Uh, these are some of the attributes of why heat pipes are used. What are the working fluids? Now, it depends on what temperature you want to transport the heat. So as you can appreciate, uh, heat transfer uh, is always done at a certain delta T depending on the uh, engineering application. So if you have high temperature, uh, you know, requirement, so uh, let us say a radiation pyr pyrometer or, uh, you know, for a standard isothermal high temperature radiation source, uh, you can use silver or lead or sodium, for example, or cesium, potassium, uh, you know, at very high temperatures. Uh, in the medium temperature range, you have uh, we can use sulfur or mercury or dotherm. For example, uh, at low temperature, one can use uh, flutec. These are uh, specialized uh, organic or non-polar uh, fluids uh, which are developed uh, for electronic cooling application. Then one can use uh, ammonia or water, ethane, for example. And then for cryogenic applications at very low temperatures, you can use oxygen, nitrogen as the working fluid. So mind you, these are the working fluids. Okay, this is the working fluid uh, of the heat pipe which you are filling inside the heat pipe. Uh, and then uh, depending on its thermophysical properties, uh, uh, its freezing point and the melting point and the critical point, you can then, depending on the application, one can choose uh, the right fluid for the right application for the right uh, temperature uh, range in which you would like to uh, transport the heat or operate the heat pipe. Now, uh, as you know, uh, this uh, particular fluid uh, is inside the wick. Uh, so you have the container, uh, you have the wick around it and then the fluid is all uh, saturated inside the, inside the porous wick. And uh, we want uh, active life of a heat pipe to be, let's say, 10 to 12 years. Uh, in, a, in a space application, for example, a satellite uh, may require a, a life of 7 years or 12 years. Uh, you know, space vehicles uh, may require longer uh, periods of time. Uh, and even for terrestrial applications, for example, solar uh, heating or uh, other type of application, electronics cooling, laptop cooling. Uh, the typical life may be of five to seven years and during this time uh, the idea is that this fluid should not react with the porous material and form some gases which are uh, harmful for the heat transfer to take place. 
so therefore uh, for if you are using water then one can use stainless steel or copper uh, nickel titanium but if you use aluminum water then the aluminum will react it will oxidize and it will form aluminum oxides and hydrogen gas will be generated uh, inside uh, this heat pipe and this hydrogen gas as you know will be uh, will hamper the heat transfer because it will it will go and collect in the condenser area which is the coldest part uh, of the of the whole device and it will block the condenser and the heat transfer as you know condensation heat transfer is uh, very severely affected by the presence of non condensable gases and therefore uh, you know aluminum water uh, heat pipes are not possible Uh, similarly ammonia copper is not possible uh, they will react ammonia and copper will react uh, and uh, again uh, you know uh, uh, hydrogen gas may be generated uh, you know inside the system uh, similarly uh, methanol acetone lithium sodium they are compatible with certain materials and they are non compatible with certain materials so uh, one has to be careful about while choosing uh, the combination of the liquid and the working fluid and the container so the container also comes in contact with the fluid and therefore it is uh, it is equally important that the working fluid does not react with the container also uh, during its entire lifetime now we will move on to section 2 which is the application of heat pipes so we will first see the applications of conventional heat pipes and then in the next lecture we will see uh, how uh, exactly to model it and we will try to understand the pressure uh, you know differentials which are created inside the heat pipe etc so the working will be done in the next lecture we will first see the applications so you know because of these uh, very attractive uh, properties uh, of uh, the passive two phase technology with such a large heat transfer coefficient uh, you know the heat pipes are used across the several industries from aerospace to electronic thermal management uh, heat pipe heat exchangers ovens and furnaces for isothermal conditions medical applications transportation and deicing systems manufacturing industry solar systems and of course space so space uh, is 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 the starting point of the journey of the heat pipe development so you can see the international space station here uh, and uh, uh, this has uh, these uh, you know radiators uh, which are there deployable radiators uh, and uh, a lot of heat is generated in many of these subsystems this heat is brought to the radiators and then inside the radiators you can see these cylindrical heat pipes Uh, you know to isothermalize and spread the heat uh, on these panels uh, of of uh, the 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 radiator uh, here is another example where a vapor chamber like a heat pipe is is embedded and then on the heat pipe there are these fins uh, and then of course air is blown or natural circulation is there uh, depending on what type of technology is is, is applicable in a particular electronic package uh, so here again in the electronic systems here you see uh you know uh, uh three heat pipes or uh, four heat pipes in fact uh which are uh, which are connected to a heat uh, heat sink here uh, with fins and then the electronic component the power electronic component can come here uh, and then uh, you can see that uh, now the three dimensional structures are possible the heat pipe is bent uh, in a three dimensional fashion uh, there are four heat pipes in fact and they will transport heat Uh, from uh, this uh, heater towards the heat sink uh, here you see a typical laptop cooler and uh, all of you have laptops and you can see that uh, behind the behind the laptop you can see uh, you can feel hot air coming out uh, and uh, this is through this fan and air is blown over here and the microprocessor chip is here and this is the heat pipe this is a three dimensional bent heat pipe uh you know which uh, which is which is connected here uh, between the heat source uh, and the heat sink uh, and uh, the heat is transported from from the microprocessor uh, through this heat pipe uh, to the to the fins and from this a uh, convective heat transport uh, to the air which is blown by the small fan here again you see an igbt cooler uh, three heat pipes two of them are bent and one of them is straight 
and again uh, you can see this is like a, a very small area where the heat is collected from igbts uh, and then this is it goes to the large area here uh, so naturally there is air flowing over here so the h uh, outside and the area here is much more uh, than uh, the the h here is high and the, so the h of the heat pipe uh, and the a1 is small and here the h2 is small uh, and a2 is large so in this way uh, you know heat is getting transported from location a to location b uh, and very efficiently so if you see any electronic package you know it has uh, it, it it has multiple functions uh, you know you have uh, your, it has to support the architecture it has uh, to uh, you know transfer proper signals uh, the conditioned power has to be given to uh, you know to from from the transformers to uh, the electronic devices uh, and and of course a very important function is to dissipate the heat generated to maintain safe working temperatures and then to give mechanical support and environmental protection so this heat dissipation in many of the modern electronic systems is actually uh, done by uh, heat pipes and if you see here uh, uh, you know any chip or a die uh, you know it 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 the the silicon chip is here it is mounted on a substrate carrier and then there is a uh, there is a casing and and finally is the ambient so there are various uh, levels at which uh, cooling is required so from chip level to the to the substrate level it is usually conduction heat transfer and then to the casing it can be via a heat pipe uh, so for example heat pipes can be embedded like this or it can be put like this so there are various uh, let's say configurations of heat pipes uh, and uh, on which electronics can be directly mounted for example uh, as you can see here flat plate heat pipe with the mounting of electronics uh, you know chips directly on the heat pipe so there are various ways at which this is level 2 and level 3 cooling uh, from the substrate to the casing and from the casing to the ambient uh, this can be brought by a, a smart combination of heat pipes and heat sinks uh, and making use of either natural convection or forced air cooling at the end but the internal transport is from for a, from a passive system uh, which is the heat pipe uh, so as to get the advantage of the superconducting behavior uh, of this particular device so here again another example uh, where electronics cooling or igbt cooling you can see several heat pipes uh, you know they are connected to a thyristor uh, here here you again see a power trans, uh, trans, uh, uh, transistor uh, which is connected to a heat pipe and a heat sink uh, here again um, uh, the heat pipe whose cross section can be seen here uh, with slightly elliptic type of a heat pipe pressed heat pipe uh, for uh, notebook cooling uh, for laptop cooling for example so the microprocessor is uh, is uh, you know uh, attached here uh, or th this particular uh, you know block is attached to the microprocessor and the heat which is generated from the microprocessor of the order of uh, 20 to 40 watts uh, is brought to the heat sink uh, where the area is very large uh, the temperature here uh, and the temperature here are more or less the same uh, you know because of the heat pipe uh, and then you blow air uh, over it to get it uh, cooled so in this way uh, thermal power uh, from the microprocessor is dissipated uh, to the ambient now here you see more examples of electronic cooling and as you can see uh, depending on the technology you can have a thermal resistance of 3 kelvin or 3 centigrade uh, celsius per watt to nearly one order of magnitude low 0 0.3 centigrade per watt it essentially means that if you have a if you have a, a 20 watt or a 30 watt device uh, you multiply it by 0.3 uh, so that is like uh, 6 degree delta t or uh, you know 9 degree delta t will be there uh, between the hot end and the ambient uh, so you can see various packages which contain heat pipe or uh, vapor chambers or uh, you know different designs three dimensional designs uh, bent designs uh, flat plate designs uh, you know uh, which are uh, part of the electronic cooling industry uh, various examples you know so one can have sintered powder he, uh, see, uh, 
uh, wick or we can have actually grooved heat wick we will talk about it in the next lecture when we see the details of the construction of the heat pipe and its uh, working operations and the physics of heat transfer here we are more interested in seeing the application we can also do from a two dimensional electronic package one can also move on to a 3d package so here you see some examples of small 3d packages uh, of the order of 8 to 10 watts uh, you know from uh, alcatel or uh, nokia or you know other uh, companies uh, which manufacture or which are experts uh, in such uh, type of 3d manufacturing where heat pipes are also embedded uh, as part of the thermal management strategy so here you can see uh, another example of a three layer modular horizontal package uh, which uh, has flat heat pipes so these are the heat pipes in fact uh, and three of them you can see uh, one two three uh, where the electronic uh, chips are directly mounted the way you can see it here uh, on the on the heat pipe and then the heat pipe works as a spreader plate uh, you know you can you can see the spread the the, the, the spreader plate here uh, and it isothermalizes the hot spots uh, of the system so here you see such a modular heat pipe uh, in the final design and this is at the stage where the heat pipe is getting filled with a valve later on this valve is removed from here uh, and uh, you can do a pinching and a welding here so that uh, there is no air leakage from outside to the inside or inside to the outside it becomes an isolated system uh, which has only the working fluid inside and its vapor it is very important that uh, any uh, non condensable gases are not formed inside by chemical action uh, or uh, air uh, is not uh, mixing with the two phase system which is inside otherwise uh, the performance of the heat pipe will go down drastically the thermal resistance will increase uh, and which is not desirable uh, then uh, you can have for high temperature applications liquid metal heat pipes as i said like sodium or potassium and uh, you can see for isothermal furnace liners or for making black bodies which require isothermal conditions uh, you know uh, the typical range can be from minus 50 to 300 uh, wherein ammonia or water can be used and then uh, beyond that uh, you know up to 1000 degrees uh, uh, liquid metals uh, can be used similarly solar receivers uh, depending on whether they are concentrator type uh, they can operate at very high temperatures uh, and uh, one can use uh, as the heater heads of sterling engines or generators for power generation in solar dish systems uh, so this is like uh, uh, the high temperature range uh, of applications of uh, or typical heat pipes uh, where uh, you know sodium uh, and stainless steel or inconel are used as uh, the wick material and the wall and the operating temperature will be from 600 to 1100 degree centigrade uh, they can uh, really uh, operate very efficiently uh, and uh, they have, they are actually in operation uh, there are several problems which are there when we apply high temperatures because uh, you know there is corrosion at high temperatures which is very high impurities can lead to a lot of damage uh, and therefore uh, you know cleaning degassing annealing these are some of the things which must be done uh, hydrogen diffusion is also a problem uh, you know uh, and therefore uh, like enamels or coatings uh, you know are used uh, so that at these high temperatures uh, these diffusional problems are avoided uh, or oxidation problems or chem chemical corrosion uh, is is avoided then one can also make large uh, you know he heat exchangers uh, which uh, are uh, you know for for let's say thermal energy recovery uh, so hot air can flow in half of the heat pipe and this heat pipes can then uh, transport this heat from the hot uh, let us say exhaust gases uh, to uh, the incoming gases for boiler operation or for some other industrial use uh, one can also make evaporation condensation loops like this uh, wherein the hot air is used to boil a certain fluid uh, the vapor travel upwards and then they are condensed uh, here you can heat up certain uh, certain gas uh, or air and then this liquid falls down which these are called a separate type of heat pipes uh, they may they may or may not use any wick uh, but with a gravity action since the gravity is working in this direction uh, the vapor the vapor uh, goes up 
uh, and the liquid comes down and these are like thermosiphons you know so heat large heat exchangers uh, or heat pipe heat exchangers can also be made by thermosiphon action uh, the way it has been shown here or it can be also used by wicked heat pipes uh, cylindrical heat pipes uh, many of them make an array and this array is then uh, you know properly arranged uh, so that uh, it it half of it is in the inlet side and half of it becomes the evaporator and the other half becomes the condenser and heat transfer can take place uh, you know from the evaporator to the condenser uh, this is one example where uh, you know an heat pipe heat exchanger has been used uh, for uh, at this location here and you can see uh, hot air coming in and then the cold air uh, be becoming hot uh, the heat recovery systems for district heating uh, is it has been employed uh, in an industrial application uh, these are for power plants again one can make large uh, heat exchangers uh, with heat pipes uh, wherein the flue gases uh, are uh, the heat, the enthalpy is taken out from the flue gas uh, and it is given to a secondary air uh, which is used for the combustion application one can also use heat pipe for geothermal energy harvesting uh, where uh, you know heat pipes can be used uh, effectively at various places uh, to take out uh, heat from within the uh, from within the uh, earth and bringing that heat in the vapor form uh, to run an electrical generator for example so there are various applications depending on uh, the operating temperature the power requirement the heat flux which is available and the geometric construction constraints uh, which are there in 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 real time applications so you can see the, the collage of industrial applications uh, cooling of electronics uh, energy systems where heat pipes are used uh, environmental devices uh, you know permafrost stabilization for example uh, then uh, vapor chambers for electronics cooling heat sinks embedded with the heat pipes uh, coupled with natural circulation or natural uh, convective heat transfer uh, very high heat flux modules bent bent heat pipes in the form of u or uh, other l shapes or t shapes for example uh, in the aviation sector also uh, a lot of heat pipes are being used now uh, for thermal management of electronic equipment and also uh, the entertainment uh, seat electronics equipment uh, so we will see some more examples as we go along uh, also heat pipes are used in automotive applications for heat recovery for led lighting Uh, thermal management of led lighting uh, and things like that so uh, finally to close the lecture let us look at the advantages of heat pipe heat exchangers they are uh, very high level of redundancy is there little maintenance compact designs you can have isothermal elements uh, you can separate the gas portion from, uh, there is no cross mixing for example uh, they are of course passive with no moving parts Uh, and therefore they are cost effective and uh, you know heat pipes can be easily assembled in heat exchanger format the cylindrical vessels as you have seen in the examples so to summarize uh, you know in this lecture uh, we have appreciated the difference between active and passive thermal management systems uh, we have been introduced uh, to passive operation of a heat pipe inv involving liquid vapor phase change technology so as you will recall uh, the liquid uh, gets converted to vapor by taking the latent heat from the evaporator section the vapor uh, pressure increases locally the vapor travels to the condenser side where because of the low temperature existing outside it condenses and now the liquid has to be brought back to the evaporator by the capillary action so we have also seen several applications of heat pipes in various industries Uh, in space in avionics in uh, furnaces in high temperature applications in heat pipe heat exchangers for power uh, power industry uh, thermal power plants uh, and of course commercial electronics uh, like laptops uh, and power electronics devices so with this uh, we come to the close of uh, the lecture uh, if you have any questions of course you are welcome to uh, contact me thank you very much